Have you ever found a really weird fossil? You know, a fossil of something you never saw before or ever heard of? Doesn't it make you curious about what it was and how it lived? What can you do to actually understand it? How can you make sense of it? To answer these questions, you need an understanding of paleoecology. Paleoecology is the study of the life and times of fossil organisms. Not surprisingly, this is a very broad field of study with many aspects. So let's break it down into two areas, autocology and synecology. Autocology is dedicated to the study of individual organisms and species. Synecology is the study of interactions between species living together. We also call synecology community ecology. You may recall that a community consists of two or more populations of different species. So synecology deals with the interactions among organisms living in the same community. When it comes to ancient organisms and species, we primarily care about their behaviors, life modes, and life histories. In other words, we care about where they lived and how they lived. We also care about if and how they moved, how they fed and acquired resources, and how they developed into adults and produced offspring. Let's explore these things in steps. Since most of the fossil record consists of remains of marine life, We'll focus on the life and times of organisms in the ocean. When it comes to where and how organisms live in the ocean, we distinguish between pelagic and benthic taxa. While benthic organisms live down on the sea floor, pelagic organisms live up in the water column. We can even go one step further. Pelagic organisms may belong to the plankton or the nekton. Nektonic organisms are swimmers. They can move through the water column under their own power. In contrast, planktonic organisms are floaters. They simply drift in the ocean currents, waves, and tides. Nektonic organisms are capable of swimming against the current. They include fish, sharks, rays, whales, dolphins, squid, and various other animals as well. Some of the most prolific swimmers today are baleen whales. Humpback whales, blue whales, and gray whales make some of the longest journeys on our planet, migrating between their summer feeding areas and winter breeding grounds each year. A single gray whale alone may migrate up to 14,000 miles round trip between its summer feeding area and winter breeding ground. Planktonic organisms, in contrast, are capable of only very limited movement in the water column. They typically float and drift in the ocean. They don't migrate. Some of the most common planktonic organisms are microscopic protists and algae. However, there are many planktonic animals as well. For example, jellyfish are considered planktonic organisms. Yes, jellyfish do swim, but they have a hard time swimming against the waves, tides, and currents like whales do. Jellyfish mostly just go with the flow. Benthic organisms, of course, make up the benthos beneath the nekton and plankton. We can also recognize different types of benthic organisms. 
After all, some organisms live on top of the seafloor, while others live beneath it. Organisms that live on top of the seafloor are called epifaunal, while those that live beneath it are called infaunal. Infaunal organisms spend their lives surrounded by sediment. These organisms include a lot of worms, clams, brachiopods, among other types of animals and protists. Epifaunal organisms live on the sea floor but are surrounded by water. They include things like sponges, corals, crustaceans, and many types of fish and snails. Of course, the lines are a bit blurry. Some organisms live halfway surrounded by sediment or halfway exposed above the sea floor. We say that these organisms are semi infaunal There are also organisms which are capable of swimming, but spend their entire lives close to the sea floor, so that they are somewhere between the necton and the benthos. We call these organisms nectobenthic. Horseshoe crabs may also be considered nectobenthic. Yes, they usually sit and move along the sea floor, but sometimes they swim above it too. And of course, there are organisms that move between the plankton, benthos, and necton over the course of their lives. Squid, for example, begin their lives as benthic egg sacs. When these eggs hatch, they release larvae, which float and drift in the plankton. Eventually, these larvae mature into nectonic adults, which are capable of swimming and migrating against the current. Beyond where a fossilized organism spent its life, paleontologists want to know if it could move. When an organism cannot move because it is fixed in one place, we say that it is sessile. Examples of sessile animals include barnacles, sponges, corals, bryzoans, and various groups of echinoderms. Usually, these organisms are immobile because they are attached to hard surfaces, like rocks on the sea floor. That said, they may also be attached to shells of other organisms. An organism that attaches itself to another is called an epibiont. The location of a sessile organism is determined at the start of its life. Many sessile organisms, like corals, are broadcast spawners. They reproduce through broadcast spawning. When coral are ready to reproduce, they release their gametes, their sperm and eggs, into the water column, where fertilization happens and produces a zygote. The zygote grows into a larvae that then settles to the ground. The sessile organism will spend the rest of its life wherever the larvae settle to the surface. Organisms that are capable of movement are called vagile. A vagile organism may be mobile or motile. A mobile organism is capable of being moved at any time, but it usually does not move, and when it does, it does not do so under its own power. Motile organisms, on the other hand, move under their own power and are capable of moving any time. Clams, for example, are generally mobile, but not motile. They can be moved, and some clams are even capable of burrowing down into sediment. But generally speaking, they stay in a single location and don't move spontaneously. Snails, on the other hand, are motile. They move a lot, albeit kinda slowly.
A final concern in the paleoecology of ancient organisms is how they fed and acquired resources. One of the basic properties of all life is called metabolism. Your metabolism consists of all the chemical reactions in your body that sustain your life and allow you to maintain your organization. There are many types of metabolic reactions. Your cells do respiration, a chemical reaction that transforms food into carbon dioxide and energy. In addition to respiration, some organisms also do photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Unlike respiration, these reactions do not release energy, but instead consume it to produce biomolecules that serve as food. Plants, for example, use their green pigments called chlorophyll for the purpose of photosynthesis. They repackage and store energy in sugars, which they can then use and consume later with respiration. Broadly speaking, there are three types of organisms today. We call plants photoautotrophs. Photoautotrophs do photosynthesis and respiration. You and I, alternatively, are examples of heterotrophs. We only do respiration. And then there's a third type of organisms, chemoautotrophs, that do respiration and a process called chemosynthesis. In chemosynthesis, organisms convert carbon-containing molecules like carbon dioxide or methane into foods like sugar using the chemical reactions involving inorganic compounds like hydrogen sulfide. Chemosynthesis is common near hydrothermal vents. There, Mussels contain symbiotic bacteria that do chemosynthesis. These bacteria take hydrogen sulfide that rises from deep in the earth out to the ocean in order to produce food, which they then share with the mussels. Indeed, chemosynthesis can support an entire food web at a hydrothermal vent, despite the absence of light. Whereas photosynthesis requires sunlight, Chemosynthesis does not. Most fossilized organisms are photoautotrophs or heterotrophs. All animals are heterotrophs, but that doesn't mean they all eat the same things. Many animals are herbivores, which eat plant materials like leaves, grasses, and algae. Other animals are carnivores, or meat eaters, that acquire their food, energy, and nutrients from a diet consisting almost entirely of other animals. Some carnivores are predators. In predation, predators hunt, kill, and eat other organisms known as prey. Other carnivores are scavengers. They consume dead animal tissues that they find, but they don't actually hunt or kill for food. Finally, some animals are omnivores. They eat plant and animal material. Bears, for example, generally eat meat, particularly when they are preparing for hibernation. But they are also known to eat other things too. In the ocean, there are two important types of omnivores, deposit feeders and suspension feeders. Deposit feeding animals feed on organic matter that accumulates in soft sediment. In many cases, the animals actually ingest the sediment along with the food. This is true of crabs. Crabs usually eat while burrowing through sediment. Along the way, they ingest both food and sand. They retain the food for themselves and then excrete the sediment out as small pellets. 
Suspension feeding animals are quite different. They feed on organic matter suspended in water. A classic example of this strategy is filter feeding in sponges. Sponges are suspension feeders, which filter food out of the water as it passes through their porous bodies. You can visualize the flow of water and organic matter with fluorescent dye, as is shown here. Water carrying food flows through the sides of the sponges and up through the central opening. Along the way, the sponge filters out the food. Clearly, there is incredible diversity in where and how organisms live in the ocean today and beyond. This variation contributes to the development of complex interactions among organisms living in communities. Some of the most basic interactions between organisms are food chains and food webs. We also find that these interactions contribute to the tiering of communities, so that epifaunal organisms are staggered at various heights above the sea floor and aren't all competing for the exact same limited resources. In order to understand the lives and times of ancient organisms, paleontologists study fossils. They consider a wide array of observations collected from these fossils. Luckily, there seems to be no great shortage of observations. There are many fossils that tell us about predation. There are fossils, for example, of bones with teeth and claw marks left by predators and scavengers who fed off of them. There are also these distinctive holes found in many fossils of snail and clamshells. These holes were created by predators who drilled into the shells to get at the animals within them. And then there is this amazing fossil from the Eocene Green River Formation of Wyoming. It shows us one 50 million year old fish that was fossilized with another in its mouth. In this case, the fish probably choked to death while eating its smaller prey. So fossils can tell us how ancient organisms fed and interacted with each other. What else can we learn from them? Fossils can tell us about reproduction. This 180 million year old ichthyosaur fossil from the Jurassic of Germany was pregnant at the time of its death and fossilization. Today, you can see the remains of its offspring preserved inside of it. This other ichthyosaur may have died while giving birth it was found with its offspring in the birth position. Together, these ichthyosaur fossils tell us some meaningful and unexpected things. Ichthyosaurs did not lay eggs like other reptiles. They carried their young inside of them like mammals. Dinosaurs, on the other hand, did lay eggs. We know this because there have been fossils of their eggs and nests found. In some cases, the nests contain the remains of the parents as well. It is possible that the parents in these cases died while attempting to protect their offspring from predators. Beyond feeding and reproduction, there are also fossils that tell us about the mobility and motility of animals. Trace fossils are fossils of behavior, and some of the most common trace fossils are burrows, trails, tracks, and footprints left by ancient organisms as they moved over soft sediment. Trace fossils, like these dinosaur tracks, help us to understand how ancient organisms moved around. Of course, our best tool for doing paleoecology may be 
Uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the concept that all of the processes that apply to the world today have always operated on Earth. This is an important concept because it means if we find a fossil, we can infer how it evolved and how it lived. Taxonomic uniformitarianism is the assumption that a fossil species inhabits the same environment and lives in the same way as its closest living relatives. Consider these major groups of animals in the fossil record. Today, corals, brachiopods, and echinoderms only live in the ocean. There are no freshwater species in any of these groups. Recognizing this, taxonomic uniformitarianism tells us that all fossils of corals, brachiopods, and echinoderms were produced by organisms that lived in the ocean. A related concept is called morphological uniformitarianism. It is the idea that the morphology of a fossilized organism can tell you about how and where it lived. It would have lived in an environment where you can find organisms with similar morphology today. As an example, leaves come in a variety of shapes and sizes. These shapes and sizes are related to the environments in which the plants live. Plants that live in warm climates tend to have leaves with entire rounded margins. Conversely, plants that live in cooler climates often have leaves with serrated, jagged, and toothed edges. It stands to reason then if you found a bunch of fossils of leaves, you could probably determine what sort of environment and climate those ancient plants inhabited. As we wrap up this introduction to paleoecology, I leave you with this thought. Paleoecology is a rich and complex field of study that can be incredibly challenging at times. It's not easy to look at a fossil and figure out where and how it lived. But the challenge is worthwhile. Paleoecology allows us to bring fossils back to life.